Hello and welcome to Extra Time. I'm Gary James with guests, former footballers Darren Rack and Martin O'Connor. Gentlemen, welcome. Hi, yeah, to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, Darren, if, if we come to, come to you first, yeah. um, started out playing uh, playing at Derby, and, and then moved around a bit. Went to was it Grimsby? You went to? And, That's right. Yeah, back and, to my home club, and, and and then coming closer to home to to, to Warsaw. Yeah. Um, but you spent a long time at Warsaw, didn't you? Yeah, it was, it was a good ten years. So uh, I got my testimonial there, and uh, had some good times, some very good times there. We had some. Um, so some times obviously weren't so good, you know, we yeah. suffered a lot of relegation promotion during the 10 years I was there, but um, no, I look back on, on that on that part of my career, great fondness and uh, also a club who, who I hold close to my heart. Yeah, and, and was it Ray Graydon was the manager? That yeah, put... it was Ray Graydon, Paul Taylor, Ray Graydon at the time and um, Ray, uh, that sort of period of time, was disciplinarian. Um, you came in, you had to come in suits, you have to come in trousers, you, you know, it was very smart, there was no telephones, uh, you really wanted to emphasise that point and it worked, you know, he got us playing in the first year, mm. I think we were favourites for relegation and, you know, we, we surpassed everything and we obviously gained promotion that year. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, Martin, you weren't at Warsaw at that point, were you? You'd come a little bit later on. No, I did have uh, uh, an incident with Ray one time. I went to see a... Uh, an old colleague of mine at, at Walsall and um, went into the physio's room. Tom Bradley was the physio and um, he's come in and says, oh, take your earring out and what you're doing on your phone kind of thing. And <laughs> I wasn't even at the club, you know, but um, yeah, obviously I've heard stories from, from Darren and a few other players, what a disciplinarian he was. And um, I think it proved right for the squad he had and for what they did when he was there um, with the budget and the, the players, if you like, fantastic time. Yeah, yeah. Now, talking about that and being a sort of disciplinarian and, and take your earring out and, and mm. uh, just thinking about, we had a, a guy on the show, um, Daniel Johnson, who's the hairdresser of the, uh, uh, to, to a lot of the players now and does yeah. uh, uh, Balotelli's hair and all this. How would Ray have gone if he'd have come in with <laughs> and a pink hair or yeah. something? Well, I, I can remember an occasion when I was at Grimsby Town, Alan Buckley was a manager, obviously, yeah. a former Warsaw player, and I dyed my own hair one night and I, I dyed it um, black. But I left on the top of my head, obviously, <laughs> on my forehead, I left a bit of the dye on. So I went to train the next day and uh, Alan Buckley just went mad at me. He says, who do you think you are? What are you doing? You're having your hair like that. You'll never play for the club. So I had to sort of backtrack and get my hair done and go back to what I, I was normally before. <laughs> but under Ray, you, you would have had no chance. No, no chance. Really? No. <laughs> no. And, and while, while you were at, at Warsaw, skip apart, um, best, best player? Ah, there, were, there were several really good players. I, mean, I was fortunate to play with, with Paul Mason, who was yeah. uh, a very gifted player. Um, obviously, we all know about problems off the pitch, so on and so forth, but on the pitch. I, I don't necessarily think people really appreciated what he was like to play with, not unless he played with. I was very fortunate mm. to be in that position. Uh, and he could see things that other players couldn't see. But there was, there was Vinnie Samways, who, who was oh, up right. there as well. He always had time on the ball. See a pass, fantastic player, great lad. Uh, but th that was just a couple of a number of players who I was fortunate to play with. Yeah, and and, and the best player you've played against? Played against probably mm. Roy Keane. I think he, we played Man United in in pre season, and uh, I can remember trying to run Roy Keane. I thought I've got him in Malacca, no problem. And the ball was played down the line, so I just started running, and he was right beside me. I thought I've got to go up a gear here just to get away from him. And he was still there, and I was thinking, my God, I'm not getting rid of him. And he was coming towards <laughs> the end of his career, and I was thinking, wow. But he was a good player, very yeah. good player. Yeah. And, and um, but then, you, I mean, you broke your leg, didn't you, in, was it 2005 or something like that? Oh, God. Um, the time, yeah, no, it was about 2006, yeah. roughly 2006, yeah. I broke my leg at Yeovil away, and I was out for a year. It took me a, a while to come back into it, and mm. uh, a long time out of the game, so... You know, it's, it's hard times. Any players who get injuries, and yeah. as Skip would know, you're in the chair, you're in the uh, injury room for a long period of time. You, you know, you're trying to keep yourself uh, keep yourself uh, entertained and doing whatever you can to keep yourself fit as well. So it's yeah, it's, it's hard. It's especially twelve career. months. Isn't it? Have, you, have you ever been out for a length of time, Skip? Not really. No, um, I think the most is about two, three months. I think it's more mental than anything else. You know, you're going to get back, which is when. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you need to keep that momentum and that focus on your job and, and your injury and, and trying to, to get back through rehab and, and physiotherapy. And, you know, f for me, luckily, um, never had that long out, but obviously I can imagine 
um, what I was like after two months, three months. I don't know what I'd be like after after twelve months. Yeah, it's like you say, what what do you do during the day? It's, you know. Well, well, that was it. I mean, I spent a lot of time in the gym, in the weights. We had John Whitney, the physio, and he, he was fantastic. So motivating you to you know to uh, to make sure you do what you needed to do yeah. to keep yourself fit. And I probably came out a little bit top heavy, you know, because I was constantly on the weights, but. Yeah. You know, it kept me focused in terms of doing something on a, on a daily routine. So, uh, yeah, probably need okay. to lose a bit. But that. how? Because I, I, I mean, I, I've never actually broken my leg, uh, touch wood. Um, but when you go back on the pitch after being a year out, you've broken a leg. I mean, in your head, do you back off a little bit? Or you, you first challenge, you're tentative. But when you're playing, you don't really think about it. It just happens. It happens in an instant. So. Although it's probably mentally in your in your mind before you go out into the mm. game, it will just happen really without you knowing. You just you, you, um, your natural sort of senses take over, and you'll just go into a challenge. And you'll think, "Oh, that's it. It's out of the way. It's done and dusted." And yeah. you just get on with the rest of the game. Yeah. And, and, and moving moving forward, coming up to date a little bit, um, you, you obviously moved from Warsaw to Kettering. Kettering. Yeah, finish. I finished my career off at uh, Kettering. Um, Obviously, well, it's a well publicised um, um, off the pitch problems for myself. Uh, I, I struggled to get all, to get another club, in all honesty. And, yeah. and Kettering was one of the only takers, so I went there, finished, uh, did two or three years there, and um, it, enough was enough. It got to the stage where I wasn't enjoying my football. Um, it was it was stood in the middle of the park, basically watching the ball going from one end to another. And I like to play football. Football mm. should be played on the floor for me, and uh, I wasn't enjoying it. So I sort of knew it came to a point in my career where I thought, you know, I've got to do something different. Mm, yeah. And, and, and when you made that decision, what did, did you stay in the game? Because I know you're still in the game now, but did you stay in the game or was it was it yeah, a break? Yeah, I, I was very fortunate. There's a former Warsaw player, Segura Ronaldo, who was who was left back at Warsaw for a number of years, and he was the chief scout at Brighton. I know Valbian Football Club, and he asked if I wanted to do a little bit of scouting. So uh, obviously, obviously, I couldn't do it full time because due to playing games weekends and sometimes midweek, I could help him out. Uh, eventually, when I did finish, though, that he asked me to do it more on a permanent basis, um, which I did do. And uh, fortunately, a job came up and uh, a role came up where it was a full time, which I'm still in today. So okay, and, and, and obviously, um, Skip, you. you as we just found out, you're you're also at Brighton as well. You're doing yeah, some stuff. Yeah, Darren. Um, again, same thing. You know, just to help him out for a few games and watch a few players. And um, I got I do enjoy um, going out, watching players, um, doing opposition analysis and things like that. It is, it's interesting. Um, it keeps you in the in the public eye, if you like. And yeah. um, you're watching professional football at all levels. Um, so from that um, point of view, it, it's good for me. So, so how, how does the scouting thing work then? Like it's a full-time job for, for, for you. Yeah, that's Darren. right. Uh, I know, and we'll talk more about your, what you're up to in, in a minute, Martin. But um, so, do you get a tip off from somebody that's already out there as a as a junior scout, so to speak, and then it's like passed up to you as as, as a senior scout? Well, or? well, I have we have eight scouts who work beneath me. So basically, they're they're all in areas around the country. So when there's a game in their Pacific area, say in the northeast of England, we have a scout in that area. They'll go watch the game. I'll listen to what their feedback is. And if we need to follow up on it, we'll follow up on it. But I've now been doing it for about three years, really, on a full-time basis. So my knowledge of sort of the championship and League One, League Two, it, it, I would say it's quite a decent. So you know the players and agents will will throw players in so you'll hear from them if we've got a follow up on them and and kids who go out on loan from premiership teams who go on there to championship clubs league one clubs will follow them up and see what their progress and yeah. their development is like mm. and, and and again so martin is one of your one of your eight or is Fundlings. he yeah, yeah. Fundlings. yeah just learning one the trade yeah, martin's <laughs> one of eight but i like to have you know one of the if you've been in football you've got to use that knowledge and for yeah. me it's it's important part martin has played the game at some uh, a very good level yeah. all the way throughout his career, yeah. his knowledge will go to waste. You know, why not? Why shouldn't I use that? I know Martin well, yeah. and so on and so forth. So I've got another three or four ex-footballers who, who are also scouts for me, and uh, I think it's the same position in any club. I will be using ex-footballers all the way through, coaching side all the way through. Yeah. I think just touching on that, guys. I think sometimes you look at clubs and their recruitment. We call it scouting, but recruitment. Yeah. Um, they are 
shall we say, less of a, a football background. So, you know, that they might come from university or friend of a friend. And I think, for me, that's where your football knowledge comes into it. Obviously, Darren's played at a good level, mm. um, played at a lot of clubs, played a lot of um, league games, so he knows. We know. Um, and when you go and watch games, it's interesting how many people are not football background. Um, I'm not saying, you know, ex-players make good scouts or recruitment. I'm not saying right. that. But what I think is, you know, we need to keep that knowledge of players, ex-players, in the game. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it's something that it really can't be taught, isn't it? It's, you pick it up from, from being part of it. It's so, an experience, you yeah. know. We know what it's like to be a footballer. We know, we like to know, um, you know, what we can see in players and, you know, off the ball, on the ball and things like that. I'm not, again, it, it's, it's that eye, you know, what they've got, what, what can you see in them, can you develop them, can we move them on, can, you know, yeah. what level of football can they play in? And to have these kind of people around... Uh, in jobs like Darwin's got, it's fantastic. Okay. Well, um, the half time whistle's about to blow. Uh, please join us for the second half, but for now, it's half time and extra time. So welcome back. I'm Gary James with guests Martin O'Connor and Darren Rack, and this is the second half of Extra Time. So, guys, um, just before the break, we're talking about your work as, as scouts basically for, for, for Brighton. Um, before we move on to academies, because that's what I'll talk about, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about working with Chris Hewton. Yeah. Because he was obviously up here at Blues. I think you worked with him up here as well, yeah. Chris. It, it, it seemed to me, because I, I, I was doing a lot of work at Blues at the time as well, and a rather a nice guy. He and is. the fans seem to really love him, you know? I, I think he is. I, I think he's an ideal fit for, for what we're looking for as a club, Brighton. He's got great championship experience, premiership obviously as well. He knows the league, he knows the players, where I think maybe to a certain extent our previous managers who we had in charge, Oscar Garcia and Sammy Hoopier, had little knowledge of the championship. So to have someone who actually knows the league is great and is, you know, is a genuine and sincere bloke, mm. he really is. Good. Yeah. Now, uh, Moving on then from the from the scouting bit onto academies. I know Martin, you're looking come August, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah. That you're going to be launching and opening your own academy. So tell us a little bit about yeah, about it, that that came about and what's going to happen. Well, I worked on one at Birmingham City, um, and for, for three three four years, and it was great. Mm -hmm. um, the experience I got was fantastic, and the, the guys that went through the system, if you like, um, were great. You know, it's not an actual academy at a football club; it's more of a development. Um, department and so I thought yeah I'll, I'll open my own um, it's basically for, for young guys 16 to 18 who want to um, play football be coached properly um, added on to that we've got an education department which um, gets them through um, BTEC level 1 and 2 and 3 of the sports diploma in the BTEC so yeah. it's, it's all rounded um, academy not just football based Right, and, and where's it, where are you going to be based? Where's your site? We, or your... We, we, we've just um, secured a venue, um, the Doug Ellis Centre in Perry Bar. Oh. Um, fantastic facility. You know, yeah. We've got an AstroTurf, we've got a, a plot of land we're developing for a, a match pitch and two training areas. Um, we've got a, a full-size uh, multi-gym and use of an indoor hall you know, for wet weather and things like that. And you know, It's a fantastic facility, six years old. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to starting in August. Yeah. And, and how will it work? Will you take people there, they'll be there full time, or will you take yeah. them from the colleges? Or no, no, it it's, it's, it's all based there. Um, you know, again, from experience, I don't really want to be sh um, transporting the guys from a training facility to an education um, yeah. school, college. So it's all going to be a bit based there. We've got um, rooms to, to do the lessons in. We've got um, coaches, stroke, who can deliver um, the, the, the BTEC course. Yeah. So they become lecturers in the afternoon. Um, and it's, you know, five days a week, um, Predominantly Wednesdays are match day, um, and then obviously weekends off, and it's run very closely to the academic um, side and yeah. the, the football side of a, a normal football club. So you'll academy. come under Ofsted and all that. Yes, sort of thing, yeah, definitely. I think you know it's it's something that I think um, we need more of. Yes, there's there's a few um, starting up now, mm -hmm. um, but I think if you're a guy um, who's interested in sports, not just football, um, from the academic side, um, it's a great vehicle then to move on to to university, maybe to an American scholarship and and things like that. So, so subject-wise, really, obviously, apart from the, the, the sport, is it, is it uh, maths, English, and then...? We do, we, we offer math and, math and English because, you know, some guys come to us with, shall we say, not the right level. Um, mm. So we have to offer that. Um, but then it, it's nutrition, it's um, sports science, it's physiotherapy, um, right. skeletal um, stuff, injuries. Yeah. So, it's, as I say, it's a full-rounded um, academic um, course, which, from experience, the guys do enjoy. Yeah, and, and where will you draw the, the, the students from? Again, we're recruiting now. Um, we've had an open day today. We've got one again tomorrow uh, based at 
Perry Bar. Yeah. Um, and throughout the summer, we're going to be recruiting for um, obviously start up in August. Is there a website for it yet? Or? That's up and running, should be up and running next week. Um, there's a Facebook page, um, Martin O'Connor Football and Education Programme, that they can just log on and see what we're doing. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's something that I've, I've looked at and I wanted to, to take part and then thought, right, well, you know, me being me, I want to do it myself so I know it's done properly. Yeah, yeah. and you obviously got a good team around you now to. Yeah, got the staff in place and um, everything. Everything's going well. Obviously, we just need the recruits now. Yeah, good. Okay, so people just if they just Google you, Martin O'Connor, yeah, it, all the links will come up from yeah. from that. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And is there anything like that happening down in Brighton? Um, are you no, there's not. I don't think there's anything similar to what Martin's doing. Uh, I mean, there's similar things in terms of community, and there is links with colleges and universities. Yeah. But in terms of what Martin's doing, I, I think it's branched out to a, into a new sort of. Uh, new spectrum of things so it, I've, if I'm not mistaken I think Martin spoke to Brighton to a certain extent yeah. about it yeah. um, so it may, might may be something in the pipeline yeah. further down. I think guys that there's, there's a, a, a missing link if you like between you've got the academy which is the elite obviously you want to be professional footballers and you've got nothing else really um, so you just need to feel that vibe because these players who, who go through the net miss you know miss their calling if you like and yeah. um, especially at that age um, what you try and create is the environment that it's not school it's more of an academy, yeah. it's more sports based, but you have to add that academy touch to, to yeah. it. And they take that on board because it's the, the, the football element that they want to take part in. So, so like when, probably when you, when you guys started playing, I certainly know in, in, in my day of, 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 of you know, getting to professional level when I was playing, it was to be an apprentice. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that was what it was like in your yeah. day. Academies didn't, I don't believe they existed no, then. It, it was like County and Birmingham Boys or yeah. some Villa well, Boys. I've got to be honest, for, for my, I was never an apprentice. I come, I come late into the game, 21 I was. Yeah. And when signed a, a, my first pro contract at 21. So that was, you know, at the time it was okay. Now you don't see that, you know, people are signing pro contracts. People are making their debuts at 16, 17. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a good thing the academy system but again you know we'll go back to what we said about the scouting I think we're losing that many and uh, that much experience with ex-players going out the game and, and doing other things yeah. rather than trying to keep them in the game and I think that's where for me the, the English football I is lacking. Yeah and, and, and do you think from obviously scouting and some of the players that you're finding and bringing on the youngsters is that again going back to the apprentice days you'd be like cleaning the boots you'd be sweeping the floor at the training ground yeah, well, they don't seem to do that now I don't think that, well, as far as I'm concerned, I don't think they're allowed to do it now. I think there's all rights what everyone has these days. But for me, as a grounding, as a bringing up, I was an apprentice at Derby County under Arthur Cox, and Arthur Cox, another disciplinarian, yeah. very strict. Um, he used to pull us back at half past four in the afternoon if there was a bit of dust on top of the changing room. Mm. We had to clean boots, um, we had to do all the jobs before we could go home. These days, they don't have that. You know, I think to a certain extent, the kids are handed on a plate what they have, they have to do very little other than concentrate on the football mm. side of it. I think they need that grounded as well to show what life is really like. And, and a bit of discipline and, and respect, isn't it, yeah. really? That's... Again, it, you know, it, it's that apprenticeship. You do your apprenticeship, you clean senior yeah. players' boots and um, you learn your trade, if you like. Mm. Nowadays, I think they, they go straight into it and they get these contracts and they get to do basically what they want to do as long as the, 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 the game their form is good, then uh, you know, coaches and, and clubs are not really bothered. And I think that's where, again, we're not producing the type of player that I think has got longevity. We're producing right. players that are just, they'll play three, three or four games and they move on and mm. that ain't what we want. And, and, and on that note, um, it's been in the news of late um, where they're talking about capping foreign players coming in. And, and I uh, think, I mean, thinking down to the championship and some of the, the clubs below, certainly like Blues and Warsaw and uh, probably Wolves, um, there's not that many foreign players in those squads. It seems to just be in the Premiership when they make that leap up, all of a sudden, ah, we we need a foreign player now because we can't find anyone yeah. good enough. Is that is that right? Or what, uh, what do you uh, think uh, about the capping? I think the capping is a good idea. I mean, in terms of bringing through players, uh, the the English players or the British players, if you want, then it's only going to be good. It's only going to nurture them through. Uh, I think a lot of the foreign players over, here, in my opinion, are over for the money. They get paid great wages. Mm even into the championship, you know, there's a number of foreigners at the top clubs who can pay big wages. Um, I think the UK clubs are, are priced out of a lot of the English-based players. It's overinflated the prices for them, uh, which makes it hard for the UK-based um, clubs to buy them, so therefore they'll look abroad where it's cheaper. You know, you can get some good players that are cheaper, but in terms for the English game, the English players, it's not very good for them. They're opportunities. Yeah. Sorry, mate, you were no, saying... I, no, I just think... 
good foreign players, yes, bring them in. Mm, you know, because yeah. we all want to watch good football. And um, the top players, great. I think you know we, there was a stage where we just bring in foreign players in for the sake of bringing foreign players in yeah. because the English market is too of inflated and too expensive. I think that's where again clubs need to look at and say you know if we're going to bring quality players in from abroad, they've got to be quality, not just because they're abroad and they're cheaper. Mm. Yeah. Um, again, it, it, it sort of stops our talent, the British talent, coming through, and uh, again that's a that's a disadvantage. Mm. Um, I, sorry, I was just going to say even at Warsaw, I can remember Paul Tay we used to bring a number of foreign players in. Um, on trial. I mean, that's how we signed Pedro Mateus, Segura Ronaldo, Giorgio Leitio, um, just to name but a few. But there was a, a, the, an influx of um, of average players, if you're honest. It's like mm. Martin said, if you're bringing quality, that's fair enough. But if you're bringing average players who are taking the UK players' jobs as such, then there's no need for it. Mm. And, and moving on, I know, Mark, you've had a, a taste of sort of a head coach or management at yeah. Warsaw a few years ago. Yeah. Um, Darren, what about you? Is management on the... No, do you know what? The... I look at management and I think, I want my managing people. Coaching, I'd let Skip... He could... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 let Skip. Thanks. I'll let Martin yeah. do that. But uh, no, the management side, it's appealing. It has, it has its positives, it has its negatives. But, you know, I'm happy in the job what I'm doing now. I enjoy yeah. the recruitment side of it. Um, I enjoy looking at players and trying to find players that would improve our team. Good, and, and still living up here in the Midlands? Yeah, still in Sutton Coalfield, and uh, yeah, I won't be moving away from here. This is my home now, yeah. so it's uh, it's nice to be here. Oh, brilliant. Uh, guys, I mean, the full-time whistle's about to blow. It, it flies by, doesn't it? it does. um, so, so many thanks. Uh, thank you to, to Martin O'Connor. Thank you to, to Darren Rack. Guys, pleasure to meet Cheers, you. Guys. Thank you. No thanks problems. again, Mark. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers we'll get you back on again soon. Yeah. Um, now, if you'd like to contact the show, then please email extratime at bigcentre.tv. If you've got a suggestion for maybe someone you'd like to see on the sofa, um, or if we're not talking about your sport, then please get in touch. But for now, that's it. It's full time on Extra Time. Bye-bye.